Chapter 56 Rowena, however, had no more time to ponder the secrets of a summon. Instead, she had to think of a way to deal with the mud golem before her. If we step out, it attacks, that's absurd. Are we trapped then? It's too early to be sure, let's attack. Stop. Rushing into an attack could be dangerous, the students murmured among themselves, voicing their opinions, fear and panic seemed to amplify their voices and stiffen their resolve, seeing them on the verge of another pointless argument, Nilia hurried over to Ihan, to control these, unheeding, friends, Ihan's power was needed? Warden as, Warden as, Ihan was deep in thought, frowning, Nilia grabbed and shook his arm, calling out again, Warden as. Ah, sorry, what's happening? What's with you? Right now, those damn, no, our friends are about to fight again, you need to step in, Ihan nodded, curiosity struck Nilia. So, what were you thinking about? Ah, I was pondering over this situation. Nilia's long ears perked up, it dawned on her that this boy from the Wardeness family had a unique insight his high regard for the Shadow Patrol's hunters and rangers, his appreciation of the hunter's wisdom, and his friendly demeanor towards Nilia herself, had his unique insight found a solution to the current situation, what is it? What did you figure out? Not just Nilia, but the other students also looked at Ihan expectantly, Ihan slowly opened his mouth. I think this is a trap set by the professors. His unexpected opinion left everyone speechless. Please undo these. Calm down, Professor and Girdle. The skull principal spoke soothingly as he released the magic chains binding Professor and Girdle's wrists and ankles. Professor and Girdle looked incredulously at the skull principal and Professor Jurger. He had been whisked away to a different place, wondering what was happening, only to find out he had been kidnapped by th Skull principal. What madness possessed these mages? I had a good reason for bringing Professor and Girdle here. You'll understand when you hear it. What's the reason? Having a sturdy knight like you around prevents students from growing when a crisis hits. At such absurd reasoning, Professor and Girdle was speechless. Seeing his reaction, the Skull Principal and Professor Jurger nodded, believing he understood. Seems Professor and Girdle understands. I do not. There are many other ways to foster growth in students. Regular and repetitive training, duels, the attitude of a mentor, proper teaching? Professor and Girdle's words made the skull principal shake his head. It was as if he was saying, this is why knights, mages aren't raised that way. That's right, Professor and Girdle, mages shouldn't be raised like that. Facing a crisis they already know doesn't cultivate a mage's creativity. Professor and Girdle restrained himself from drawing his sword. This was a magic academy, not a knight's academy? I might as well return to a knight's academy. Professor and Girdle might be confused now, but someday he'll understand my intentions. Fine, to give the students a crisis, you made them walk for hours into the deep mountains, face bad weather, and give them a surprise crisis in an unprepared situation. Let's say that's the case. Professor Jurger was bashfully taken aback by Professor Ingerdel's words, to be praised that much. It's not a compliment? Anyway, there are other dangerous monsters in the mountains. It's treacherous and complex enough to lose one's way with just a little inattention. What will you do if an unforeseen situation arises, like other monsters appearing? At Professor Ingerdel's question, the Skull Principal and Professor Jurger simultaneously cocked their heads and answered at the same time, shouldn't the students overcome it on their own? Shouldn't the students handle it themselves? Professor and Girdle's shoulders slumped in despair, I was foolish to even attempt a conversation with mages? The more exceptional the mage, the more bizarre their worldview seemed to be, a mage worthy of teaching at this academy was likely half mad. Professor and Girdle gave up on further dialogue. Fine, call me if there's a problem or if anyone goes missing and a rescue team is needed. Right, right, seems you've changed your mind a bit. I haven't, sighing. Professor and Girdle was comforted by Professor Jurger, who offered him a warm cup of tea. Don't worry too much? Professor and Girdle, 
what I prepared isn't that dangerous, it's just bulls enhanced with potions, Professor Jurger had diligently prepared for this alchemy assignment, he had carefully set up monsters in the location where the potion ingredients were, just like the last time, the students might curse him now as that damn Jurger, but in the distant future, when they become outstanding alchemists, they'll be thankful, thinking, ah, Professor Jurger, thank you, the bull should be a fair challenge for the students, these words somewhat reassured Professor and Girdle, even though the bulls were enhanced with potions, there were quite a few exceptional freshmen in the mountains now, capable of skillfully handling the situation? Do they breathe fire? No, they don't, teleport? They don't do that either, other special attacks? Immunity to blades? A fearsome presence? Roaring? Do you plan to invest the value of several mansions into a single bowl? Professor Jurger replied with incredulity, just increased strength and agility would be enough, to grant all the abilities the Skull Principle mentioned would require a fortune, the Skull Principle grumbled, seemingly disappointed. Boring, bring on some other monster, do you think a monster will appear just because you say so? At first, Ihan's opinion sounded absurd, but as time passed, his friends increasingly found his viewpoint plausible. It was partly due to Ihan's own credibility, if Ganondo had said the same thing, they would have dismissed it as nonsense, but coming from Ihan, they thought, well, Wardenaz wouldn't speak without reason, above all, Professor Jurger had a history, the students vividly remembered their first alchemy lesson, the wickedness of Professor Jurger, who had sent a mad pig to attack them. For such a professor, it wouldn't be strange? To have set up the mud golem, then where did Professor and Girdle go? He must have planned it with Professor Jurger, that's too much. Professors, I tell you. You can't trust any of them. The students were outraged at Ihan's speculation, even Professor and Girdle, whom they had trusted, turned out to be on Professor Jurger's side, Ihan coldly reassessed the situation, it's just too coincidental. Arriving at the location where herbs and ingredients flourished, Professor and Girdle suddenly disappeared, rain began to fall, and a mud golem appeared. It was too precise to be mere coincidence. At this point, suspicion was warranted, Warden as, if this is indeed a trap set by Professor Jurger, what should we do? We need to find a way to deal with that mud golem, Ihan responded calmly to Asen's question. Seeing despair in the students' faces, Ihan tried to boost their spirits, cheer up, everyone, since it's a trap set by Professor Jurger, there must be a way to solve it, that's right. Indeed, if the mud golem was a monster prepared by Professor Jurger, there must be a way to overcome it, the students, initially intimidated by the golem's daunting appearance, began to consider how to tackle it, what if we try fire or acid potions? That's a method for trolls, it seems to attack when the line is crossed, should we try erasing the line? Can such a trick work? Let's blind the golem, if it can't see, it won't notice us escaping, let's shoot it with arrows. Asen, listening to the student's conversation, thought it was time for Warden As to take charge again, otherwise, all sorts of futile methods would emerge? Rowena approached and said, the princess suggests using spirits to distract the golem. Wait, where did Warden As go? Ah? Uh? Asen looked around in confusion. Ihan was nowhere to be seen. Has anyone seen where Warden As went? Could he have been kidnapped? I'll break through the golem and find him. The students were far more panicked than when the mud golem appeared. However, Ihan hadn't disappeared. Yonair was startled to see Ihan suddenly emerge behind the mud golem. Warden as? The chatting students doubted their eyes when they saw Ihan cross the line and appear behind the mud golem. The mud golem, instead of capturing Ihan who had crossed the line, stood there stupidly. How did you? Magic. I used invisibility magic. While his friends were busy talking, Ihan had conducted a simple experiment. He tested whether the mud golem would notice him using the invisibility magic on his belt. Fortunately, 
The mud golem didn't notice Ehan passing by, moreover, there was an additional finding. Once you break the line once, you can become visible again without the golem caring. That was a significant discovery, you already mastered invisibility magic. No, I borrowed the power of an artifact, you already made an artifact. It's not that I made it, the students from the black tortoise looked puzzled, huh, did we sell such an artifact, was there such an artifact? This isn't made by the academy, it's a gift from a religious order, wow, which order would give such a gift? The Prazinga order, both tower students grimaced at the mention of the Prazinga order, Ihan felt slightly hurt. Although Ihan had escaped, the situation hadn't significantly changed. All the other students were trapped in front of the mud golem, Warden as, go down and call the professor. We can't send him alone. What if Warden as decides to abandon us? Does Warden as look like Ginondo to you? Stop talking nonsense. Sorry, I misspoke, Ihan ignored his friend's words, given that this was likely a trap set by Professor Jurger. The chances of the professor coming even if called were slim, solve it with our own strength? Fortunately, the fact that Professor Jurger had prepared this meant it was solvable at the freshman's level, move. Ihan threw an iron ball and swung his staff, the iron ball began to spin in midair, find the core that forms the golem, Ihan planned to hit the mud golem indiscriminately to locate the core, Yonair cried out in a worried tone, will it be all right? It's a golem, after all, no matter that it was made of mud, a golem was still a golem, the thickness of its body was extraordinary. The concern was whether the magic of a freshman could penetrate it, however, Ihan nodded as if to say it was okay, if this had been a wild golem, Ihan might have considered other options, but this was a sort of assignment prepared by Professor Jurger, then it won't be too strong. The staff swung and the iron ball exploded directly on the golem? Chapter 57 With a thud, the sound resonated, the iron ball, propelled through a magic spell by Ihan, hit its target precisely, the mud golem, however, what followed was beyond Ihan's expectation. His complexion changed, a sign of surprise, the connection to the iron ball had been severed, embedded within the massive body of the mud golem, the iron ball was now irretrievable, Ihan clicked his tongue in annoyance, berating himself for his oversight, the mud golem, sustained by mana, was a formidable opponent, any object linked by magic, once inside, was likely to be disrupted by the golem's own power. Clatter clatter, the bone summon waved its hand, seemingly pleading to be sent. Fourth. Can you extract it? Then, go. Ihan commanded, upon his order, the bone summon charged, scampering over the mud golem, it struggled mightily to dislodge the iron ball embedded in its back, silence ensued, but the ball was embedded too deeply, despite its frantic efforts, the bone summon couldn't reach it. Enough, come back, Ihan called out, disheartened, the bone summon withdrew. Fortunately, the mud golem did not attack, Ihan mused, no need for invisibility magic just yet, prepared to flee if necessary, he now readjusted his stance, readying for another attack, the iron ball approach had failed, but, water orbs might work, reluctantly, he acknowledged the usefulness of Professor Bolotti's teachings once more. Dodging projectiles and practicing magic under Professor Bilotti had enabled Ihan to counter water orbs, the concern now was their destructive power, aren't they weaker than iron balls? Ihan had initially chosen iron balls for their greater destructive force, despite the ongoing rain, moreover, the process with iron was simpler, lift, focus, and release. Their heavy material and ease of concentration naturally lent them greater power, water orbs, in contrast, were more complex and thus disadvantageous, they required summoning water, forming it into orbs, and then propelling them a process several times more complex than that with iron balls, Ihan, who had mastered. Iron balls, still struggled with water orbs, a fact that had earned him numerous reprimands from Professor Bilotti, 
spring forth. Ihan conjured a water orb, water sprang up in midair, swiftly compressing into a sphere, the rain seemed to make the process easier. Thud. As I thought, not effective, the water orb burst, but its impact was weaker than that of the iron ball, evident from the shallow crater in the mud, even the bone summon shook its hand in disappointment, Ihan pondered, the professors, as heartless and ruthless as they are, wouldn't prepare a golem like this without some strategy to defeat it, though this particular golem wasn't prepared by Professor Jürger. Ihan had no way of knowing that, Professor Jürger knows I'm under Professor. Bolotti's tutelage, he must have discussed it with him, perhaps there's a way to utilize the magic I've learned from Professor Bolotti? Round and round, Ihan lifted his head, the water orb was spinning in a circle, seeing this, he let out a bitter laugh, due to his extensive training and repeated failures under Professor Bolotti, even his subconscious movements now traced circles, suddenly, an idea sparked in Ihan's mind, what if I rapidly spin the water orb itself? Ihan pondered the possibility of enhancing the orb's penetration by spinning it before release, as opposed to simply throwing it, ceasing the circular motion, Ihan began to spin the water orb, swoosh, perceiving Professor Ingertel's apparent displeasure. The skull principle sent a telepathic message to Professor Jürger, do something about it, Professor Ingertel was a rare talent, difficult to come by even for the Magic Academy, the prospect of him resigning and leaving was too dreadful to contemplate, the principle dreaded the aftermath having to submit a letter to the emperor, stating it wasn't my intention to torment him, explaining to the imperial dignitaries I'm not purposely tormenting the examiners, and pleading with the knights. Please, I really won't torment anyone, just lend me a swordsmanship professor, the mere thought was horrifying, why me? Professor Jürger grumbled, but descended to the cabin's cellar, to fetch a hefty amount of honey wine from a dwarf-made barrel, after all, the request came from the principal, don't forget the snacks. Professor Jürger gathered smoked meats and vegetables from the cabin's shelves, his eyes catching the vegetables Ihan had harvested and left behind, oh, I was planning to eat those, as frugal as he was in ransacking the hut, those first harvested vegetables were what Jürger himself intended to eat, but the skull principal was very observant. Surely, you're not going to bring delicious food just for yourself, are you? Damn it, resigned, Professor Jürger carried everything back. Thump, here, Professor Ingertel, please enjoy. This is my own honey wine, vegetables from my garden, and meat I smoked myself, my goodness. Our alchemy professors brew, a celestial flavor unseen anywhere in the empire. The skull principle was not very good at praising. Fortunately, Professor Ingertel, a kind-hearted elf, appreciated the gesture, raising his glass and complimenting the flavor. This is really good, Professor Jürger. Thank you. It wasn't just politeness. The taste was genuinely delightful. A skilled alchemist was also a skilled cook and brewer. It couldn't be anything but delicious. Feeling the atmosphere lighten, the principal spoke warmly. Don't worry too much about the students. It was much harder in my time, the two relatively younger professors remained silent at the principal's stories, which seemed to go back to ancient times, well, everything was tougher back then, this batch of freshmen is quite interesting, they'll overcome any moderate crisis on their own? You're right, Professor Ingertel nodded awkwardly, feeling somewhat reassured by the principal's words, wondering if he had been overprotective. Perhaps the slight intoxication contributed to this sentiment, right? Take, for instance, the student from the Wardeness family who went to the mountains, isn't he quite astute? The other two professors agreed with the principal's remark, Ihan, the subject of their unanimous interest, was indeed a topic they all resonated with, as the younger professors empathized, the principal's mood brightened? Exactly, so don't worry too much. The warden as lad is clever enough to learn from my magic books on his own, and there's another student who? The two professors, who had been quietly enjoying their honey wine, paused at the principal's words, what did you just say? About what? You said he's learning from your magic book on his own? 
Both Professor Ingerdel and Professor Jurger stared at the skull principal in astonishment. It was common for a professor to provide personal instruction to a student in a magic academy? But the skull principal was an exception, as his recent comment revealed, he belonged to an ancient breed of mages, his way of thinking diverging from that of contemporary professors, realizing his slip of the tongue, the principal, a mage from ancient times, chose to press forward rather than retreat, I am the principal and representative of this academy, am I not allowed to give instruction as I please? The principal sensed the mood was not favorable, the two professors were not easily swayed, recognizing the disadvantage, he changed tactics, it's not just me, Professor Baladi Bagrak also gives personal instructions, doesn't he? And you, Jürger, are doing the same. With the cunning of a seasoned mage, he implicated both present and absent professors, a deft move typical of an old mage, no, I only provide instruction appropriate for first-year level, so does Professor Bagrak, but you, you're different, aren't you? Professor Jürger exclaimed in disbelief, the tasks Jürger had assigned to Ihan, though physically demanding, were entirely safe, posing no risk of madness? In contrast, that skull principal was a person who would teach all sorts of arcane and bizarre magic even to a first-year student. Professor Bagrak is also teaching magic beyond first-year level. Last time, I heard he was practically teaching third-circle magic. The principal, having drawn in Professor Jürger, now shifted the focus to the absent Professor Baladi Bagrak, and it wasn't a lie, indeed. Professor Baladi had been teaching something akin to third-circle magic. The boy from the Wardenass family recently passed the training of perfectly drawing circles with an iron ball, dash really? That's impressive? It's tough to demonstrate such control with first-circle magic, dash, so we've moved on to the next stage, dash, and what's that? The water orb magic? That's 2 and D circle, isn't it, dash, the circle, a measure of a spell's complexity, was determined by the number of steps in casting it, summoning water and maintaining it in an orb form was classified as second circle magic, he succeeded in creating an orb made of water and is now drawing circles with it, dash adding control to it essentially made it third circle, of course, it wasn't officially third circle magic, true third circle magic involved weaving all these steps into one spell with a single staff movement and incantation? separately performing the steps of summoning water, forming it into an orb, and then rotating it in a circle was strictly third circle magic, but it was nonetheless an impressive feat, if one becomes familiar and quick with magic, it could potentially lead to mastering third circle spells, a first year student struggling with second circle magic was now completing such a complex task, any other professor might have been shocked. But the principal coolly accepted it, that's good to hear, dash, he. Then thought to himself, dash, if Baladi is doing this, then there's no issue with me personally transmitting magic too. Dash, what nonsense is that? It's like a dwarf grazing on grass. Professor Bagrak's methods are his own? And your magic is yours. Professor Jürger of course, did not fall for the principal's words, he harbored doubts about whether Professor Bagrak was truly teaching third-circle magic, and even if that were true, the principal's teachings felt significantly more dangerous, I'm teaching safely. Only magic that matches his level, I swear it upon my honor. I swear it upon my very magic. Ah, if that's the case, then we'll believe you. The two professors reluctantly set aside their suspicions when the principal swore on his magic. They had suspected that the principal was teaching incomprehensible ancient magic to first-year students, potentially damaging their brains. Fortunately, it seemed that was not the case, but what exactly is Professor Bagrak teaching? Water element combat magic. Upon hearing a detailed explanation from the principal, both professors were amazed. While not exactly third circle magic as the principal had described, the fact that a first year student could demonstrate such proficiency was truly remarkable, 
an astounding result possible only with a combination of talent and effort, I'm not a mage, so I don't understand fully. But is it common for a student of that grade to show such achievement? It's very rare, perhaps he has a special affinity with the water element, of course, that alone wouldn't suffice, other talents are also necessary, wait, isn't Professor Bagrak specialized in magic combat? So is he now doing repetitive training? It's a tremendous ordeal for both mana and mental strength. Ah, that's really troubling. Well, well, he wouldn't go beyond that. The training he's currently doing is manageable, isn't it? Given the difficulty of the magic, it's unlikely to escalate further. Swoosh. I've done it. The water orb, furiously spinning in place, created a buzzing sound. Ihan, with a throbbing headache, looked up at the mud golem. Um, um. Um. Chapter 58 He had lost count of how many hundreds of times he had tried. The orb he had finally managed to create was a testament to his perseverance. Ihan? Isn't the orb too big, though? I don't know much about that spell, but, Yonair asked with a perplexed expression, the other students also shared a similar sense of bewilderment. The water orb, which had initially been the size of a fist, was now. It had grown as large as a huge boulder. Boulder? It was so large that one might wonder if it could still be called an orb. Shush 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 the giant water orb whirled around, making a menacing sound. Asen spoke to his friends as if asking what was going on. Warden Az surely knows how to control a spell properly. There's a 100% chance that's how the spell is supposed to work. Is, is that so? It seems too dangerous for a spell used by first years, Rowena stammered, and Nilia spoke up in his defense, what do you take Wardenas for? Wardenas can certainly handle that much. Ihan appreciated his friend's sentiments, but it also felt like a burden, suddenly, he felt overwhelmed, have I overdone it? There had always been a saying among young mages, don't meddle with a well-made spell. A single spell was a complete formula, a world in itself, an inexperienced mage meddling with it was unlikely to end well. What Ihan was doing wasn't a drastic alteration, but it was an alteration nonetheless. Am I doing this wrong? Maintaining the spin of the highly compressed water orb was challenging for Ihan at this moment, unknown to him. This was a spell difficult even for senior students without specialized training? A high-difficulty spell requiring the maintenance of the orb's shape with a set amount of mana while also spinning it inside, of course, Ihan was unaware of this, so, he infused more mana into it to maintain the spin, as he increased the mana, the water orb began to spin faster, but it couldn't withstand the amount of mana and started to distort, so, Ihan simply increased the size of the water orb, but as the orb grew larger, the spinning force began to decrease again. So Ihan infused even more mana into it, normally, the situation would have led to either the mage collapsing or the water orb bursting, however, Ihan's mana was too vast to collapse, and his concentration was much greater than expected in maintaining the orb, eventually, after several minutes. Ihan succeeded, he managed to maintain the shape of the water orb and make it spin in its complete form though it had grown dozens of times larger than the original. No, I definitely feel like I can control it, Ihan aimed the water cannon, no, the water orb at the golem, it was already difficult to maintain such a barely controlled spell, go. Bang, with a loud noise, the water orb shot out, unable to withstand its own power, it flew slightly off the intended target, oops. He had aimed for the golem's back but hit its shoulder instead, Ihan clicked his tongue in disappointment, can I really recreate that again now? Just making one has given me a headache, thump. The students present couldn't believe what had just happened and blinked in astonishment, the mud golem, struck by the water orb on its shoulder, literally exploded into pieces, wow, whoa. Wardenaz. Wardenaz. Warden as. See. What did I tell you? Ihan looked dazedly at the remains of the mud golem, even though the orb had missed its mark, 
its power was still formidable. Whether it was due to the orb's inherent power or the golem's weakness was unclear, but Professor Bellotti's teachings weren't wrong. Thanks to them, I survived. Of course, Professor Bellotti had never specifically taught anything like this. Wardenaz, are you okay? I'll carry you. No, I'll do it. I shall carry you. As Ehan staggered from the aftereffects of using magic, his friends rushed over. They grabbed Ehan's arms and legs, tugging at him until he felt a headache might develop from nowhere. I can walk on my own. Oh, really? After resting a bit and gulping down the remaining coffee, his mind cleared, Ihan was somewhat surprised at his own recovery, maybe coffee is indeed a magic potion, regardless of where it's from, slurp, dash? Hmm, the rain seems to have lightened a bit, Nilia, is it okay to leave now? Normally, I would like to wait a bit longer, but, let's all leave. Wardenaz says it's okay to go. Listen to the end, you guys. Nilia was frustrated by her friend's eagerness to move before she had finished speaking. Ihan called his friends back to their original positions. I would like to wait longer, but seeing the mud golem appearing? We can't be too cautious. Let's move now while the rain has weakened. I'll lead. Just follow me. Don't stop halfway. Don't stray off somewhere else. Don't get distracted by something interesting. Ah. Aren't those wrinkle fruits? They look delicious, black. Ihan struck a student from the black tortoise on the back with his staff. The student exclaimed in surprise, Sore, sorry, Mr. Wardenaz. The atmosphere quickly became orderly. The students of the black tortoise straightened their clothes and posture. Nilia looked gratefully at Ihan, but he was inwardly lamenting, Damn, I should have made someone else do it. It turned out that Nilia played the role of the kind teacher, and Ihan, the harsh one, although it was an effective arrangement often used in school excursions and field trips. Ihan had wanted to play the role of the kind teacher himself. I should have let Nilia do it, unaware of Ihan's inner thoughts. Nilia finished her instructions. Everyone form groups, make sure no one is missing, speak up immediately if there's a problem, are we all set? Let's go. The students lined up and started their journey. To an onlooker, they appeared too disciplined to be believed as students of a magic academy, light. Ihan cast a ball of light upwards, illuminating the surroundings. It was to assist the students following him, not just Ihan, but other students capable of magic also used their spells to help their friends. Seeing this, Ihan had a thought. Perhaps now I can try using fire magic? Fire magic seemed most appropriate under the current circumstances, although the rain had eased, the students were all shivering from the cold, Professor Garcia did advise against it, Professor Garcia had cautioned Ihan from using fire element magic within the academy premises until his skills were more refined, Ihan risked injuring himself with such magic, however, in the rainy conditions. The danger seemed minimal, the main concern was whether the fire would ignite properly in the rain. In fact, students who knew the fire ignition spell were unable to succeed with their magic in this rain. The continuous rain, along with the cold and damp environment, affected the mage's focus. Dash, can I light a fire in these conditions? As soon as this doubt surfaced, the spell was halfway to failure. Let's try, blaze. Ihan visualized fire and recited the spell. He remembered the movements perfectly from watching his classmates enviously during Professor Garcia's lectures. Whoosh! Nilia, walking beside him, perked up her ears and jumped. Ihan had unleashed a fierce flame forward. Thankfully, the flame vanished quickly, but the shock remained. Sorry, Nilia didn't scream, worried it might startle the students behind her truly befitting of a former member of the Shadow Patrol. Instead, she expressed her shock physically waving her hands, widening her eyes, and stamping her feet. Her actions clearly communicated her feelings. Really sorry. I didn't expect to lose control like that. What? What did you do? Nilia asked in a shocked voice, Fire ignition? Then? 
Nelia couldn't believe her ears, since when did the magic to create a small flame become like that? It was my first time using it. I lost control, but now it's fine. I've got the hang of it. Ihan controlled the size of the fire as if to prove his point. A flickering ball of flame hovered in the air. As the warm heat embraced them, Nelia's expression softened. Blaze. Why? Uh, nothing? Nelia wondered if it was all right to use a first circle spell consecutively, but held back her question, just as Ihan respected her abilities as a hunter, she too had to respect his capabilities as a mage, that's what friends do, ah, but can I keep several of these lit? Nelia glared at Ihan, nevertheless, the fire and light quickened the student's pace, the balls of flame Ihan summoned warmed the frozen hands and feet of the students. Professor and Girdle is indeed absent. Upon reaching the spot where Professor and Girdle was last seen, Ihan looked around. Professor and Girdle was nowhere in sight, but Ihan wasn't disappointed. Did he had suspected as much all along? It's indeed a trap set by the professors. Creek dash. The bone summon suddenly shivered and hid behind Ihan, as if afraid of the spot where Professor and Girdle disappeared. What's this? Ihan focused his mind, he felt a familiar mana from where Professor and Girdle vanished, where had he seen it before, boom. The students all turned in shock, from the opposite direction they came, a mud golem was rampaging towards them. While Ihan's group had a leader in Ihan, the students of the immortal phoenix and white tiger lacked such a leader, when a mud golem appeared, the students voiced their own opinions, throw potions to take it down. Dash attack it from all sides, if we draw its attention in different directions, we might have a chance, dash how about using magic to attack, dash let's just do everything, dash isn't that a good idea, dash what happens in a project when dozens of ideas are implemented all at once without any coordination, naturally, it turned into a mess, throw it, the potion is effective, it must be one of Bartrek's creations. Dash isn't that a potion made by Priestess Sienna? Dash oh, is it? My mistake. Dash spread out and stab it. Prevent it from reforming. Dash, despite the chaotic approach, the students fought quite well. They threw hastily made potions to weaken the mud golem, and students from the white tiger brandished spears and swords, carving away at its body. It was a display of combat prowess befitting those from knightly families, but that was as far as they got. When the effect of the potions wore off without having defeated the mud golem, the students quickly started to fall. Back, dash, retreat. Retreat. We'll be smashed to pieces if we stay, dash, run. If you want to live, run. Dash, realizing their weapons were no longer effective, the students began to flee, screaming, unfortunately, they were running in the direction of Ihan and his group, Ihan muttered to himself as he watched the chaos approaching from afar, such useless fools, Nelia decided to pretend she hadn't heard, for the sake of Ihan's image? Chapter 59 Inch Anxiously, Asen posed a question. Can't we just leave it behind? There's a 90% chance it'll endanger us too, right? His words caused a stir among the students of both the black tortoise and the blue dragon, who looked at Asen with shock. How could he say such a thing? Hey, even if we leave the white tiger guys behind, there are still the priests, one student remarked. We can't just abandon the priests, another added. How can you think so coldly? A different voice chimed in, these reactions made Ihan wince, he, too, had harbored the same thought as Asen, it's too late to leave it behind now. Everyone, scatter. Nilia urgently shouted, having faced dangerous monsters in the mountains numerous times, Nilia was well versed in such situations, she knew that blindly fleeing with the monster at their heels was more perilous, they needed to disperse, slow the creature down and then make their escape, while running, Rowena urgently asked. Can you use the Eumidifus's water bullet spell again? What? I don't know what that is, but I can't use it right now. Just focus on evacuating everyone. 
Ehum responded, recalling too late that Eumidifus was a famous imperial mage known for creating several water-based spells, but regardless, the spell wasn't immediately available, it had taken him almost half an hour to complete last time, with the mud golem rapidly approaching, I hide in the night. Ehon muttered a spell and disappeared into the rain, he had already confirmed that the mud golem relied on sight to find its prey? It's a pity, but, approaching the mud golem, Ehon retrieved a smoke chalk from his pocket, an imperfect artifact he had bought from the black tortoise's black market, go. With a crack, smoke billowed near the mud golem, momentarily blinding it, Ehon drew the morning star, a sword given to him by the academy principal, known for its anti-magic properties, the sword, made of black purple stone, absorbed the surrounding mana, emitting a strange sound, even the bone summon recoiled from it, aim for the legs. With a thrust, Ehan didn't intend to capture the mud golem? Just blinding it and binding its feet is enough, mud golems are different from other monsters, they won't keep chasing if the students disappear, the effect of the morning star was better than expected, the golem, struck at the ankle connecting its thick legs, couldn't recover immediately and lost its balance, kneeling in one knee, then something fell from above? Instinctively, Ehan caught it, it was a dwarf from the white tiger? Bartrek Bark who had been gripped in the fist of the mud golem, looked around in confusion, he was being held by someone invisible, what are you doing? Aren't you going to get up? Startled by the nonchalant voice of the unseen person, Bartrek hurriedly stood up, could it be, Warden As? Now it was Ehan's turn to be surprised, how did this white tiger guy know? How did you know? I just thought. There's no one else from the Blue Dragon who would do something like this. Ehan was speechless. How could that even make sense? Help Bartrek. Assist Bartrek. Bartrek. We're coming. As the mud golem paused, the students of the White Tiger regrouped and prepared for an attack. Despite being beaten and fleeing, their spirits were unbroken, which was truly remarkable. Certainly, Ehan was furious, he muttered, seriously, these useless fools. Bartrek, for the honor of Warden As, who had just saved him, pretended not to hear, these guys can't even evacuate properly? Ehan's plan was simple, using the weakness of the mud golem he had found earlier, Ehan confused its sight and bought time, meanwhile, the students were supposed to evacuate on their own? Once all the students had disappeared, Ehan would use the power of his invisibility belt to vanish effortlessly, it was a straightforward and quite decent plan, but it was completely ruined by the students of the White Tiger, of course, the White Tiger students hadn't heard Ehan's plan, so there was some room for understanding, but that weighs off little significance to Ehan, hey, run away. Everyone, get out of here. You don't need to come to help me. Bartrek was puzzled, but he did as Ehan instructed, the person who had just blocked the mud golem's vision and saved him wasn't another student, but Ehan, with his tower's pride and conscience, it was a situation he couldn't refuse. However, the students of the white tiger ignored Bartrek's words. Bartrek. We're coming to help. Bartrek, we're on our way. Bartrek involuntarily looked for Ehan, who, of course, was invisible, thud the mud golem, which had been stopped to recover its legs and had smoke around it, slowly started to move again, it seemed that the students of the white tiger, coming through the smoke, had agitated the golem, the creature appeared to turn its head, staring intently at them, it looks like it's identifying a target and pursuing it, hey, how did you manage to get through here? The mud golem wouldn't have easily let you pass? Ehan asked Bartrek, Ehan could turn invisible and get behind the mud golem, but the white tiger students didn't have such means, we threw a mud dissolving potion, Priestess Sienna knew how to make it. Ehan was surprised, such a thing existed, if such a potion was available, it wasn't impossible to weaken the mud golem itself, great. Where is that potion? We've used it all, Ehan restrained himself from smacking his own forehead, 
invisible as he was, such a precious potion, wasted so carelessly? Are their heads just helmet holders? Sigh. After a deep sigh, Ihan refocused, the white tiger students showed no signs of backing down. Given the circumstances, he had to inflict as much damage as possible on the mud golem before the smoke cleared entirely, the best method now? Slicing with the morning star would be too small a wound for its size, and water beads would take too long. Without time to ponder, the white tiger students were nearing. The mud golem had already raised its fist, damn it. Blaze. More out of instinct than thought, Ihan cast the spell. Being close to the mud golem, he was within range, and the spell was more aggressive than others. But the effect was far greater than Ihan had anticipated, whoosh, Bartrek ducked in surprise, suddenly, a fierce flame surged, engulfing the mud golem, the flame, which should have been extinguished by the pouring rain, kept burning, fueled by Ihan's mana, amazing. Bartrek was honestly impressed, many students from the White Tiger may have disliked and envied Warden as, but this was undeniable, among the new students, it was astonishing to see one burn down a mud golem with a single spell, the disparity was so vast that it inspired more awe than jealousy, I can't believe this. However, instead of admiration, Ihan let out a curse, I'm sorry, Professor Garcia. Ihan now physically realized why Professor Garcia had advised him to practice fire element magic later, in his haste, he had poured more mana into the spell than he could control, and the flames quickly became wild, escaping his grasp, he had been too arrogant with his earlier success, fortunately. The mud golem absorbed the frenzied flames with its own body, otherwise, the fire would have spread in other directions. Crackle. What's that? Ihan looked up at the sound of cracking, the mud golem was crumbling, being baked by the flames. Commonly, one might think that fire would harden clay, but if the earth wasn't properly prepared, it wouldn't harden? When baked, instead, it became fragile and crumbled like this. You. You were aiming for this. Bartrek was beyond admiration now, and Ihan found it hard to respond further. Ihan dispelled his invisibility spell. Then, he joined the students of the White Tiger, who had rushed over, coordinating with them to slash and stab at the mud golem, already brittle and crumbling. The golem couldn't withstand any longer. It collapsed and fell apart. Whoa. We got it. We did it. It's all thanks to you. Well done. Ihan was puzzled by the white tiger students who crowded around, expressing their gratitude, what's this? He understood the joy of defeating the golem, but why were they suddenly so friendly after the fight, but who are you? I don't remember seeing you before. Which family do you belong to? The white tiger students, while expressing their gratitude, sensed something was off. They had assumed Ihan was one of them since he was fighting alongside Bartrek, but the more they looked, the less he seemed like a student of the White Tiger. Unable to bear it, Bartrek stepped in, he's not from our tower. He's Warden As, from the Blue Dragon, Ugh, Ak. The students who had just been thankful now recoiled in shock, some even falling over, they seemed more startled than when the Mud Golem attacked. What, what are your intentions? Helping us? No, how did you deceive us? Using the rain? But that doesn't make sense. Did you use magic to trick us? As the white tiger students indulged in wild speculation, Ihan shook his head in disbelief. Bartrek, limping, interjected, he had been injured when the mud golem grabbed him? Warden S came here to help us, he saved me. Stop talking nonsense, everyone, Bartrek. Are you okay? It's just a sprain, but I'm fine, can you gather the other students? Before we scatter too far, it's better to regroup, at Bartrek's words, the white tiger students nodded, not all were recklessly brave students, the priests, and priestess from the immortal phoenix or the more cautious, and in Ihan's view, smarter. Students of the White Tiger had chosen to flee rather than fight, 
they needed to be called back before they lost their way in the mountains. But, are we just leaving Bartrek behind? Warden as, you won't do anything to Bartrek, right? Ah, no, it's not that I don't trust your honor, but Bartrek is injured, and, confronted by Ehan's cold gaze, the students of the White Tiger became subdued, stuttering out their excuses. Is everyone accounted for? Yes, we've checked, no one's missing, Ehan confirmed the headcount of the students from both the Blue Dragon and the Black Tortoise, looking around. He saw that the students from the White Tiger and the Immortal Phoenix had also gathered, while Ehan's group had no injuries. The White Tiger students had the most casualties, given their reckless charge at the Mud Golem. It was rare to find a student without bruises or fractures. The priests and priestess from the Immortal Phoenix were busy providing first aid to these friends, Priestess Sienna, in particular, true to her flaming order heritage produced and distributed pain relief and bruise treatment potions. Yonair marveled at her skill, she's amazing indeed. Being from the Flaming Order, she knows a lot of recipes, and her speed and craftsmanship in making them are just. However, Ihan, who had heard stories of jealousy involving Priestess Sienna, was troubled. If only you weren't here, I would be the top. Dash, such thoughts suddenly flashed through his mind. I've already made enemies with the White Tiger. I don't want to make enemies with the immortal phoenix as well. As Ihan was pondering this, Priestess Sienna approached him, I heard you fought the mud golem directly, please, drink this, it's a bruise treatment potion, Ihan isn't injured, Yonair started to kindly explain, but Ihan was quicker, he swiftly took the potion, downed it in one shot, and then expressed his admiration with all his might, this is, the finest potion I've ever tasted. Huh? Huh? Yonair was puzzled by Ihan's intense reaction. Sure, Priestess Sienna was skilled, but a potion made in haste couldn't be that remarkable, could it? But Ihan's fervent response was just beginning. The skills honed by forcibly listening to the professor's boring stories were spewing fire. Did you make this potion yourself? Unbelievable. This should be sold for money. By the gods. As Ihan continued to express his amazement, he glanced sideways, there, he could clearly see it. Priestess Sienna's face was brightening with a beaming smile. Chapter 60 Inch Upon realizing the connection, Ihan's response grew even more intense, he struck his forehead, exclaiming loudly, Amazing! Truly! Priestess Sienna, of the Flaming Order, is remarkable. Yonair, whispering in a hushed voice so others couldn't hear, asked, Are you hurt somewhere? No matter how she thought about it, it seemed to Yonair that Ihan might have eaten something wrong. However, everyone else, except Yonair, seemed pleased, particularly Priestess Sienna, who was visibly very satisfied. Indeed, Ihan of the Wardeness family, you truly have a discerning eye, even a blind man without sight would recognize the greatness of this potion, you flatter me too much, replied Priestess Sienna, covering her rising smile with her sleeve, while Ihan responded with a smile of his own, after exchanging a few more pleasantries, Priestess Sienna returned to the students of the immortal phoenix with a very satisfied expression, Ihan sighed, thinking to himself, that was exhausting, it was tiring to show such an exaggerated response that wasn't genuine, but his efforts were not in vain. After returning to the Immortal Phoenix students, Priestess Sienna began praising Ihan, typical of the Wardeness family, so courteous and discerning, dash, was there any trouble, Priestess, dash, no, nothing of that sort, it's just his discerning eye, dash, seeing that reaction, it seemed like the students of the Phoenix Tower didn't need to worry, Yonair, even if you rank first in alchemy class, I won't poison your cup. Ihan joked, are you really not hurt? Yonair's eyes were filled with concern. After administering first aid, the students began their return journey. Those with unhealed broken legs were carried by their peers. Fortunately, no monsters appeared on their way down. Bartrek. You weren't harmed by Wardenaz, were you? Bartrek, Wardenaz, didn't brainwash you, right? 
Bartrek, Wardenaz, didn't use forbidden dark magic on you, did he? I told you, nothing happened. Bartrek was incredulous? Even when he told them Ihan had helped, they wouldn't listen, and how could someone in our year even cast forbidden dark magic? At first, I thought it was just a silly rumor, but after seeing Wardenaz's magic abilities, I didn't believe it either, but seeing Wardenaz made me think the rumors aren't just rumors, the White Tiger students agreed, half seriously believing the gossip, probably the Wardenaz family secretly trained him in magic from a young age, the Wardenaz family is truly terrifying? The rumors about Ihan's powerful lesser control magic, although it was a failed aim, and his performance in the basic dark magic class had been greatly exaggerated, other tower students, who had more opportunities to interact with Ihan, didn't harbor such bizarre misunderstandings, at most, they thought, he does have the charisma expected of someone from the Wardeness family or he rules the students of the Blue Dragon with an iron, emotionless hand, but the White Tiger students thought. Differently, they were seriously frightened, Wardenaz doesn't seem as scary as Marathi and others say, Bartrek tried to clear up the misunderstanding, feeling obliged to do so since his life had been saved, Bartrek, who summoned the magic that took down the golem earlier. It was Wardenaz who summoned it, was that flame an ordinary spell? Bartrek was at a loss for words, unable to refute, he couldn't believe he was being out-argued by those who believed such absurd rumors, hey! As the White Tiger students were chattering, Ihan approached, the students instinctively gripped their wooden swords, their eyes trembling and bodies tensing up at the sight of Ihan, what are they, prey animals? Ihan thought incredulously? W what is it, Warden S? It's nothing much, you all must be exhausted after all the hard work, Ihan offered snacks from his backpack. They were the oldest ones stored in his personal chamber's pantry, but still tasty enough, flatbreads filled with sweet jam and sugared biscuits, Ihan decided to clear out the food before its expiration date and earn some brownie points, even though the White Tiger students had initiated the quarrel as if to say, you dislike me for no reason? I'll give you a reason, Ihan wasn't fond of meaningless fights by nature, T thank you, Warden as. The White Tiger students' faces showed a conflict between should we really eat this, and but we're so hungry? Eventually, the latter one, at their age, such hunger was unbearable for anyone, Bartrek of the Bark family? I heard you're from the east, here, take these rice balls and cakes. Bartrek was slightly moved by the food offered by Ihan, Ihan knew he was from the east and had even shown such considerate care. In the vast empire, students usually weren't interested in foods from regions other than their own, and Wardenaz wasn't even from the east, such kindness was unexpected, perhaps the rumors about Wardenaz were exaggerated, after Ihan left, the White Tiger students, who hastily gobbled up the snacks, seemed to think similarly. Maybe we misunderstood him, did you hear? I overheard the Blue Dragon guys saying that Wardenaz took down the Mud Golem over there, with just one water spell. They said he summoned a dragon made of water? The White Tiger students were astonished, really, Wardenaz is truly terrifying, as Professor Jurger and others were exchanging drinks, he suddenly realized something, wait, aren't there any vegetables? He remembered bringing the vegetables harvested by his student, Ihan but now they were nowhere to be found, the culprit could only be one person, as the skull principal couldn't have eaten them, what's the matter? Professor Ingertel noticed Professor Jurger's gaze and asked in bewilderment, oh, nothing much, just, you really enjoy vegetables, don't you? Oh dear, Jurger, still holding on to that ancient stereotype that all else love vegetables? It's sad to see such prejudices still exist in the school's representative, so, because you're a dwarf, you must like beer, right? I do like them, yes, oh, my apologies, Professor Ingertel apologized, he then continued, it's not that I only like vegetables, but they were strangely delicious, so I kept eating, is that so? You don't really like vegetables much, 
do you? Not true. I eat them well when they're served, probably just drenched in meat juice. What's with making such a fuss over it to Professor and Girdle? I'm truly sorry, no, not at all. Please, enough of this. Professor Yerger resolved never to invite the skull principal to his cabin again. The principal, unable to enjoy food or drink, seemed to find pleasure in tormenting others. But it does make me curious. The human heart grows curious about things it cannot have. Professor Yerger lost his appetite. The students are returning? What did I say? They would all handle it themselves, right? Professor and Girdle suddenly stood up and rushed to the door. The skull principal shook his head in disapproval. Such a tender heart. The students, upon seeing Professor Jürger and in Girdle waiting, were not surprised. They had already been informed by Ihan. Instead, they glared with resentful eyes. When I become a great mage of the empire, I'll trample these professors first. When I become the empire's greatest swordsman, I'll break these professors first. When I become a high official of the empire, Professor Yerger burst into a hearty laugh and said, You all did well on your journey. Yes, thanks to you, Professor, it was very enjoyable, seeing that none of you are surprised, you must have guessed, yes, that's what alchemy is? Be vigilant always, crisis can strike at any moment, in any situation, the students pondered seriously about how to surprise Professor Yerger with an unexpected crisis. They wanted to throw an unanticipated crisis at the professor. Professor and Girdle apologized with a regretful expression. I'm sorry, everyone, I really intended to stay. Of course, you did, humph, you're all the same? Even the white tiger students glared at Professor and Girdle. The professor was taken aback. I'm telling the truth. The principal appeared and teleported me away, forcefully. It's all right, professor. We won't trust anyone anymore. Isn't that what the academy wanted? The students, hardened by their ordeal, had matured and toughened up. Regardless of the tower, a basic distrust of professors had set in, when his own students, with whom he had shared the bond of the soul through swordsmanship, looked at him with distrust. It tore at Professor and Girdle's heart. Professor Yerger pretended not to notice the glare directed at Ingirdle. It's not my fault, Professor Ingirdle. Blame gone adults, Ihan, observing Professor Ingirdle's reaction, tilted his head in confusion. Huh? Did Professor Ingirdle really not know? Of course, that reaction could have been an act, but there seemed to be sincerity in Professor Ingirdle's response. Everyone disbelieved his excuse about being abducted by the Skull Principal. It's not entirely implausible. It's something he would do. Do? Creak, 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 a bone summon clattered, pointing towards the cabin. Ihan felt a familiar mana emanating from the cabin, similar to what he had sensed in the mountains. In that moment, Ihan remembered whose mana it was. It was the principal's mana, really? Ihan was astonished, no matter what, to abduct a professor so abruptly? Now that I think about it, it's not that surprising. It's something he would do. Ihan quickly regained his composure and said to Professor and Girdle, Professor? I believe you. The principal must have abducted you, student warden as. Professor and Girdle was so moved that tears nearly formed in his eyes. After ensuring all students were accounted for, Professor Yerger became curious. How had these students solved the trial he had prepared for them? So, how did you resolve it? Warden Ash used the Eumidifus's water bullet spell to blow away the mud golem, and he caught another mud golem by burning it with fire. Professor Yerger was momentarily taken aback by the unexpected responses. He was at a loss about where to begin his inquiry. Wait, just a minute, hold on. Why are there mud golems? What about the bulls? Where did the bulls go? What now, Professor? Please stop. Do you think we are children? The students of the Blue Dragon snorted in derision. They believed Professor Yerger was attempting to deceive them again. No more being fooled, no. Why are there mud golems? I didn't prepare mud golems? Ha, huh, of course, you didn't. They just happened to appear. Did everyone hear that? 
Professor Jurger said they just happened to appear. Let's believe him. Professor Jurger reflected, if only slightly, on his life.